On March 18, 2008, presidential candidate Barack Obama gave one of his most resonant speeches. His subject was, to use the phrase of Langston Hughes, America and the Racial Mountain. Obama's speech was entitled, More Perfect Union, a phrase he often used in speeches during his campaign and early in his presidency. More perfect is the sign of Ralph Waldo Emerson's moral perfectionism, to use the contemporary American philosopher Stanley Cavell's term for Emerson's view, that while we move toward provisional goals, we do well not to fret about arriving at a destination. We dwell in process and betray that process if our orientation is toward predetermined results. Our journeys don't end. Our business is unfinished. Our poems open upon ever new poems. More perfect is a direction, a movement, not a final state of idealized perfection. The poetics here is ethical, not moral, dialogic and situational rather than fixed and rule-bound. Obama's speech begins with a slight truncation of the opening words of the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, he elides of the United States. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, probably a phrase that many of you will know, not a perfect one, but a more perfect one, with an emphasis on process rather than final destination ever more perfect, never achieving perfection. It's no wonder Emerson's moral perfectionism is called pragmatic. We do the best we can. Obama's poetics are explicit, in this quote from the president, we perfect our union by understanding that we may have different stories, but we hold common hopes that we may not look the same and we may not have come from the same place, but we all want to move in the same direction. Very odd uh, to me, uh, not so much in this piece, but to, to come here to Poland in my capacity, whatever I am, and to quote the, in a positive way, the sitting U.S. president. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> but that speech is a great speech of, about racism. Without saying the word, Obama continues by holding forth the truth of miscegenation, of the syncretic, as the promise of a more perfect union. Quote, I am the son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas, unquote. And this is the grace note on which he ends his speech. That is where the perfection begins. We are always at that beginning. It is the promise of America. So today here in Warsaw, allow me to recast our U.S. <coughs> national motto, E Pluribus Unum, from many one, in the name of an ever-emerging dialogic poetics of the Americas, as in unum pluribus, in one, many, but also in pluribus unum, within many, one. The question of what kind of union or unity exists in the diverse poetries of the Americas is vexing but rewarding. It is a founding question for the poetics of the Americas. The incommensurable cultural divergence of American social space the many in our putative one, the indissolvable multiples in our indivisible union, our states united by difference, not sameness, is itself something not necessarily shared by European and American poetics. I sit here today on the ground of another great experiment from decades before I was born, which aimed to expel difference in order to increase harmony through sameness. But the move toward homogenization versus miscegenation is powerful in the Americas as well, since the poetics of the Americas is the continuation of European poetics by other means. <coughs> the aversion of an originary or authentic or correct language is foundational for the poetics of the Americas and makes a sharp contrast with those European nationalists that place a single language as fundamental to national or literary identity, or who work to police national identities in ways that go beyond being born in a place, which, unlike <coughs> in part of Europe, is sufficient for US citizenship. Several years ago, my father-in-law, who was born and grew up in Berlin, tried to reclaim his German citizenship under repatriation laws. His request was denied because he had never actively claimed 
his citizenship, his German citizenship, during the Nazi period, when he was a teenager. He was told that he was Polish, the country of origin of his parents. But he would be unable to claim Polish citizenship because knowledge of Polish, the language, is required. Yiddish is not then, even now, considered a proper language of this nation, which has just the problem, in, which was just the problem in the first place, now compounded. The power of American poetry comes from mixing many languages, and the resistance to the dominance of any one language, including English, or any way one kind of English. As, I've, as I have argued in the Poetics of America in my way, the Poetics of America's in my way, in, it is the overturning of standard English by second languages and vernacular dialect speakers that defines American poetry, which is not to say that there is no resistance to this idea in America. When I explore the Poetics of Representation of the Kurban, the Yiddish word for destruction, I don't do so as an American looking at Poland and Germany, but as someone whose intellectual and cultural foundations are European. I feel as much my story as anyone else, I feel it is as much my story as anyone else now alive, and that a part of European culture destroyed here lives on with me, in and as an American and is expressed through a commitment to the syncretic and the miscegenated poetics of the Americas. In my talk today, I want to bring together a few strains from the essays I have completed in Pitch of Poetry, starting with the poetics of Occupy Wall Street and going on to the poetics of representation of the Kerbin. Which is to say that the meaning of American forms remains emergent that it is the mark of moral perfectionism, including our cultural agonisms, the overlay of melting African-American dialect, immigrant social languages, mainly from Europe, and the ghostly silence of scores of indigenous languages. The question of who owns a nation or a people is not, of course, just one of language. We can say in the U.S. that Occupy Wall Street raised the specter that the 1% whose control is through cultural tolerance combined with economic dominance. But the closer analogy in the U.S. for the systematic extermination process here in Poland is the mass incarceration of African American young men, stripping of them the opportunity to fully participate in American cultural and economic life. In Poland, you have about 224 prisoners per 100,000 people. In the U.S., it's over 750. But for some age groups of black men, it's over 10,000. One in nine people in the population of African Americans. More than one in three black young men without a high school diploma is currently behind bars. I think this gives you a good context for the issues that have arisen right now in the last couple of days in the United States. In the 60s, we used to say, heighten the contradiction. And when the contradictions were excruciating, were so excruciatingly high that you'd think the political center was some kind of home brew of meth and glue, things just seemed to get worse. And that long-for breakthrough in collective consciousness not only didn't happen, but seemed each day that much further away. I know Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I got that tattooed on my cerebellum, but some days the will's just not there anymore. I always thought those who described George W. Bush as incompetent missed how successful he was in creating irreparable environmental damage, and how well he succeeded in his agenda, including massive redistribution of wealth. Crude as this measure is, the flow of money from the many to the few is a fairly accurate guide to Republican Party policies. So perhaps more than ever before, I began to internalize the public events of the day. I felt I was being poisoned by them. When the 2000 election came around, I wanted to see a public art that pushed back against the fair and balanced double binds of the mediocracy. Anti-war sentiment on Iraq was the equivalent of pro-war sentiment. The Bush lies were as valid as questioning lies. How is that 
how is it that those of us demonstrating against the invasion of Iraq in 2003 knew the claims about weapons of mass destruction were, un were unverified, while the mass media did not? Yes, the answer is obvious. I am speaking here of my emotional reaction to, let's call it, the ideological terrorism of constant mendacity in the mass media. Mendacity is a word that you may or may not know. These lying things <coughs> were being said by Paul Newman and Callan Hobbes. Too much mendacity. Uh, unproductive anger and frustration mixed in with a range of not apparently related frustrations and disappointments, both personal and with developments in poetry and art. The left and liberal mainstream publications are so addicted to self-restraint that they don't allow much in the way of unruly political art. In any case, let's not let's not taint confused, let's not let containted or confused emotions get into it. Surely that will undermine the legitimacy of our position, which is grounded in rationality alone. I was seeing probity, but I was wanting satire, sarcasm, irreverence, outrage, mocking. There is no wide circulation public forum that would publish my idiosyncratic political placards. But I had my own website and put them up. This is a point that George Lakoff uh, makes, I think, most effectively in a, a book of his called Moral Politics, that the right in the United States uh, traffics in um, hyperbole and sarcasm and captures people's metaphoric imagination. But the, 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 the official liberal establishment in the newspapers and so on is committed to kind of techno-rationality, which loses the the engagement with the metaphoric structure that might create a stronger oppositional tone. So it's impossible, for example, for me to ever be published in the mainstream, even with poems that are very political, because they're, they're outrageous in a way, and they make fun of their own forms, and so on, such as my uh, poem I wrote, The Ballad of the Girl and Man, which you could think of because it was a perfectly good anti-Iraq uh, uh, war poem, but because it was sarcastic and, and, and mocking, it, it couldn't be published in any of those publications where if they have a liberal poem, it's always earnest and sincere and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I had, or a certain version of what earnestness and sincerity is. Um, I have a sign on my office door, which I had in Buffalo, I don't know if you remember this, made by the Spanish artist Rogelio Lopez Cuenca, do calm, which means have calm, you know, take it easy. Poetry makes nothing happen, which is a reference to the famous lines of, of Auden in one of his poems, Poetry Makes Nothing Happen, which I would interpret as, in the most powerful sense, as a Buddhist thing. It makes nothing, it allows nothing to happen, but could also mean that poetry has no force. But Lopez went with marvelous in saying, relax, poetry makes nothing happen. We want to talk about the poetics of Occupy Wall Street and salute that poetics. We want to embrace the way that poetics resist assimilation into the trivialization of thought and a resistance to the language of mass media. There is a direct relationship between Occupy Wall Street and a poetics that sees the representation of reality as always at stake when we use language, that insists on creating our own frames rather than translating our intuitions, aspirations, and demands into tabloid commodities or Democratic National Committee talking points. But as you insist on asking, who is this we? What cover does it provide? Populist politics, in this case, like they say, on the right side of history, meaning the left side, opposing the redistribution of wealth from the many who create it to the few who hoard it, is, by definition, a populist position. The slogans of Occupy Wall Street have a poetics that I admire, but not as poetry, if I can make the distinction. I am already as troubled by as I write it. This struggle is not about poems or artworks, and so I would say the relation of poetry to Occupy Wall Street is necessarily minimal. Poetry, the kind of poetry I want, is, that, is not the 99%, but the minus .099%, a splinter or a fraction inside a negative number. You praise Occupy Wall Street for refusing a phony, polarizing consensus. So perhaps poetry's minus 99 is also Sprock, 
what Occupy Wall Street is fighting for, a social mathematics that doesn't prey on accumulation, but recognizes the negative economy. Those who spin not and, I can't, and can't even get jobs sewing. It takes a poetics to hear and respond to OWS, but OWS speaks not in the language of poems, but with the aphoristic wit, but with aphoristic wit and symbolic gestures. The people's advertising, not the poet's rhetorical implosions. Demonstrations like Occupy Wall Street are symbolic and need to be read symbolically, but it is not like reading a poem. The credo of the mass media is always literalized, so the clash with OWS's modus operandi creates a frontline resistance to the assimilation and ultimately domesticating of the protests. The symbolism of OWS is not only ambiguous, but also amorphous, which has allowed a resilient mobility through the metamorphosis reformation, with energized manifestations sprouting up in new places, headless but not heedless, averting central authority in favor of dispersed, localized collectivities. Act as if there is no use in center, quote from Virgin Stein. You say rhizomatic, I say autopoiesis. The more you evict, the more it convicts. Cut off its head, more heads grow in its place. So I don't know how, to what degree this is very much embedded within American culture, not difficult in the way my poems sometimes are, but just to what degree you follow the criticism of Occupy Wall Street, which is a global criticism. It didn't have leaders, it didn't have a clear positions, which I'm in favor of, but also trying to distinguish from what I think of as poetry that I'm interested in, which also undermine those very positions in the way that Occupy Wall Street uh, can. So I'm interested in much more levels of ambivalence and, and um, destabilization in poems, whereas Occupy Wall Street still has this poetics of refusing a center as, as its basis and was criticized for that ambiguity, although I think in the end it was remarkably effective and, and mobile. But this is all in theory, which is why it works symbolically, at least for now, since it remains to be seen how any of this will look in a week, a month, or a year. The amorphousness also counts for the ability of different groups to identify with Occupy Wall Street, to see their own, our problems on display. Young people with uncertain economic futures, many underemployed and unemployed, certainly connect at a visceral level with the mottos and the primary participants. Labor unions see this as our issue. But it's crucial not to unhinge the symbolism from the social conditions that engendered it. Rather, we need to think with and through these symbols. The eviction of the demonstrators from various encampments is outrageous because it violates democratic principles of free speech and the right to protest. So here I'm referring to the mayor of Town of New York, Bloomberg's a police action against the demonstrators. But the violence against the demonstrators is trivial compared with the violence of evictions by the banks, the effects of Wall Street. The mass media and the right often feel Occupy Wall Street is discredited by the cohabitation with the homeless and occupiers. But the plight of the homeless is one of the real costs of American injustice and of the destruction of the safety net. This is not a problem for OWS, but for the mediocracy, which will not acknowledge that the plight of the homeless is a result of public policy. Newt Gingrich, the right-wing politician, can say that the occupiers, quote, should go get a bath after, should, should go get a job after you take a bath. Because he understands how the media prefers a big lie repeated by a guy in a suit in the sight of millions of poor American children without enough to eat as a result of policies he and other Republican candidates put into place and continue to support. Satan has learned the trick of not smelling, but suffering flesh still stinks. <coughs> That's the smell of social truth. So this I can do a gloss on these paragraphs. So the criticism that, the, uh, with, with the, that really the Occupy became a, a camp of smelly, anarchist, homeless kind of people is to be very powerful. Gingrich is exactly right in responding to that, because that is the, the point. We, whoever that may be, but it is just that kind of aside this movement has no use for 
and is also therefore central to it, cling to the symbols of the involvement of poets and writers. But I would not leave the tactical thinking on this movement to the poets I love the best, at least not if they have their poet hats on. So poets and writers and artists want to be part of this, not just as citizens, but also in terms of their, our work. I wrote in Utopia, just at the point of uh, Occupy, but just before it, along with a poem called Strike, which also resonates strongly with the Occupy movement. And I'll just read this one uh, poem from uh, just, just before Occupy, about a month before. In Utopia, they don't got no rules, and Prime Minister Cameron's criminality pure and simple, and actually criminality pure and simple is, is, is relevant to, to mention also, I don't know how much you remember him accusing that, but there he's referring to uh, uh, demonstrations and protests by people in, in England uh, against the, the new economic regime, so it resonates even with some of the demonstrations of this week in America, Crimina criminality pure and simple, because they're violating rules, rather than think about the context of it. In Utopia, they don't got no rules, and Prime Minister Cameron's criminality, pure and simple, is reserved for politicians just like him. In Utopia, the monkey lies down with the rhinoceros, and the ghosts haunt the ghosts, leaving everyone else to fend for themselves. In Utopia, you lose the battles and you lose the war, but it bothers you less. In Utopia, nobody tells nobody nothing, but I gotta tell you this. In Utopia, the plans are ornament and expectations dissolve into wit, into whim. In Utopia, there is a pivot. In Utopia, love goes for the ride, but Eros is at the wheel. In Utopia, the words sing the songs while the singers listen. In Utopia, one plus two does not equal two plus one. In Utopia, I and you is not the same as you and me. In Utopia, we don't occupy Wall Street, we are Wall Street. In Utopia, all that is solid congeals. All, that's mel all, all that is solid congeals. All that melts liquefies. All that is air vanishes into the late afternoon fog. You can't evict an idea. Then again, of course you can as various sharp-witted friends have duly noted. It happens every time the victors tell the tale. But you can't stop me for saying you can't. And in saying that against all odds, well, it's a kind of poetry. The rhetoric, but we could just as well say poetics of Occupy Wall Street, has worked brilliantly. Even the criticisms of the rhetoric have become welcome alternatives to the banal repetition of how politics is supposed to work and what you need to do to be effective. What is the relationship of the 1% to the ruling class? Just a kinder, gentler term, less strident, for something similar, if not identical? The Democratic Party, as Bush too liked to call it, oh, excuse me, the Democrat Party, as Bush too liked to call it, <laughs> always emphasizes the struggle of the middle class not the poor and certainly not the working class, a class that on some measure do better than the amorphous, non-unionized, precipitously unemployed, so-called middle class. I am more likely, even in writing this critique of the language of political opposition, to say working people than workers. Partly this is the response to a pragmatic fear of red baiting. So yes, I am always concerned with the distance between the observer and the object of scrutiny, but I think it also relates to a difficulty of facing, representing, acknowledging the poor at a time when so many of our poor are children, and in particular non-white children. In Self-Reliance, Emerson writes, then again, do not tell me as a good man did today of my obligation to put all poor men in good situations. Are they my poor? So this is a very famous remark of Emerson about the problem with pity as putting you at a condescending distance from those people you so characterize. Extreme, in, extreme income inequality is our problem. Addressing this issue is in the self-interest not only of the vast majority getting the short end of the stick, but also of those in the 1% who care about the viability of the system that brought them their wealth. Altruism, the religion of the do-gooders, is not the solution because it misdiagnoses the problem. 
Patronizing the poor is not a means of solidarity. The current state of education makes me poorer and my, wor and my work harder as a college teacher. It practically cripples the economic basis for poetry. The homeless man I pass late at night at Penn Station returning from work makes me shudder when I directly look at him, even more violently when I look away. Sukati Park was a small oasis, a symbolic autonomous zone against the permanent occupation by the 1% of the surrounding buildings, the city halls, the police, Wall Street, the trustees of our nonprofit universities, right up to Congress. The irony is that by symbolically occupying a small public park, the protests brought home the non-symbolic occupation of the major institutions of the nation. So this is a way to read the protests and perhaps a willingness to read those events symbolically, metaphorically, and metonymically in a political culture and often a poetry culture that literalizes all it sees and all it touches. Literalizes in the sense of de-realizes and also the sense of manipulates. I would never advocate poetry per se, but rather a particular poem, just that it's not politics we need, we always have that, but a politics that allows us to see the causes and outcomes of economic and social justice and proposes ways to reverse or contain such injustices. But the description of an injustice is a poetic problem. There are no neutral descriptions that speak for themselves, uncolored by words, no way of being entirely free from manipulation. The sophists had it right on this point, but beware a sophist bearing truth. Nor do images speak for themselves, even as they are served on platters of platitudes to tell us wordless one thing or another. People like to speak of telling truth to power, but the task of poetry is to speak truth to truth, and no one wants to hear that. I can't really be a standard bearer for a social movement because I can't bear standards, <laughs> or want to lay them bare. Could we call this patapolitical? Calling the signs of the political to account for themselves? Every movement needs poets, but once in office, laureates rule. Where we dwell, not political poets, but poets in, around, and about, and beside the political, is in the in-between, providing a way to get through the long periods of disappointment by connecting the knots. Then the next section now is on these uh, uh, memorials. Like many, I resist the expressive deceptions of traditional memorials, which is why Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial is to me the more perfect embodiment of what is possible, not so much negative capability as negative dialectics. So I don't know if you know the Maya Lin, it's, ver, it's, the, it's the monument to the Vietnam War, it's on the Washington Wall, very controversial black wall. It goes into the ground and has the names of the people that died. And very much opposed by the right and, the, and the, by the, um, uh, some veterans groups who insist on putting up a statue of, 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 of a, a heroic statue as opposed to what they consider to be this gash and taint of um, uh, uh, about the war. For this reason, I also appreciate Brian Hall's Irish Hunger Monument in Lower New York. I also turn again to Marcel Offal's Sorrow and Pity, Raymond Fetterman's Take It or Leave It, Jerome Rothenberg's Kerbin, and above all, Claude Lonsman's Shoah. To this company, I would add Christian Bolotansky's To Be a Jew in Paris in 1939, an installation on the walls of a small country courtyard a visitor enters after buying a ticket and passing through a full-scale security check at the Musée d'Art de History de Judaism in Paris. Bolotansky has posted the names, birthplace, professions, and sometimes deportation dates of the 80 French Jews who lived in the building that currently housed the museum, making a ghostly presence of those exterminated during the war. As you move through the museum and look out the window, you see these names pasted on the wall. These works punch enough holes in their representation to breathe life into a matter both behind and before us. My wife Susan B. and I were recently in Berlin 
where by chance we stayed quite near Ahava Kindershein, the children's home, the German, the, the Jewish children's home where Susan's mother took refuge as a child. Susan's mother, as it turns out, was born in Wuj, but lived in uh, Berlin and was at this children's home. As Susan writes, my mother, Miriam Laufer, lived there from about 1927 to 1934, 1934. When she was 14, the whole home moved to Palestine, rescuing many of the children, including my mother. Ahava, which means love in Hebrew, still exists in Israel, the, the organization. With this building as our touchstone, the whole Mid district took on a quality of a memorial, a shadow world under whatever we were seeing. It is unlikely that people of our generation would ever be able, much less want to, get out from under this shadow. For this reason, the most powerful works of memorial art I found in Berlin were the dispersed stumbling stones, small obtruding plaques embedded in the pavement created by Gunter Deming. Each brass plate acknowledges one individual, noting that he or she lived just there and giving a date of birth and of abduction or murder, if known. This, too, is a more perfect memorial. And the snapshots, like my not very good one that I have online and I can give you the URL for, become part of the process of mourning. I'm specifically not showing you these images because part of this is to not have pictures. I was far more skeptical of the official Berlin Memorial, Peter Eisenman's Memorial for the Murdered Jews of Europe, which is in the center of the city. The afternoon we went, it was a mellow scene. Berliners ate their box lunches on the edge while children were blissfully playing tag or maybe hide and seek amidst the unevenly sized and placed blank slates, which suggest gravestones without names, just the opposite of the stumbling stones, the abstract idea removed from the concrete particulars. I was going to suggest that instead of the game of Marco, Polo, the kids try out a refrain of Adolf, Hitler, <laughs> but there was nothing about this site to disturb a child's sleep. Bland abstraction of this kind, nothing trouble, nothing game, seems so well-meaning as to be worse than nothing. Perhaps it was just as well that the Underground Information Center was closed. <laughs> In contrast, the oldest Berlin Jewish cemetery was not more perfect, it was just plain perfect. The Gestapo had trampled the stones in the cemetery in 1943, and it has been left to its own devices, becoming a radiant field of green, with the exception of a replica of Moses Mendelssohn's grave and one extant original grave. Now, I'm going to elide uh, two uh, sections uh, here uh, about American poetry that I thought to in, in, in include. But one is a work by a contemporary American poet named Rob Fitterman, you can find information about online called Holocaust Museum, which I like again with the pictures uh, left blank because it just includes the captions of photographs at the, at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Just the captions of the photographs, no photographs at all, endless lists and so on. And um, I also talk about um, work that's very interesting in this context, but again, I won't uh, uh, read about it right now, uh, which is Charles Reznikoff's. Holocaust, Charles Reznikoff, a, a, a poet born in the late 18th century, uh, using found materials, and in the case of Holocaust, he used Raoul Hilberg's Destruction of European Jews, really the great historical document. And uh, what I say about this here, I'm just talking about that work, was that on Penn Sound, I never liked this work in an earlier essay of Reznikoff. I take the perception that he writes about, uh, in testimony, a work of the 1930s. He takes uh, violent crimes and he writes poems about them. And, um, uh, uh, abuses of, of, of workers in industrial accidents, and you make short poems based on these legal documents. It seems to me the, the material of Holocaust, which is not America, is overdetermined. So already, it, it, it's so horrific that you can't actually get the kind of access that he wanted. But in the um, reading that he gives at 81, which we have on Penn Sound, his just gleeful uh, contempt uh, uh, for the 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 Nazis, as he says, Heil Hitler a number of times, uh, take the document, is, is so delightful as to bring uh, something between Mel Brooks and Charlie Chaplin <laughs> to mind and, 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 and change my attitude about the work because of the contempt you can hear in the sound report. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to now just um, 
however, read the something I've written about a German author from 1985, Heinrich Bacher's Seerstuck, um, which is a short conceptual poem uh, that, that he published. In the original 1985 version of Bacher's Seerstuck, the only paratext is the one you see on the last page of the text proper, where he says that the reference is from the International Military Tribunal, Nuremberg, 1949. Though subtle in the extreme. So this book, maybe I'll, 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 I'll summarize it. Searstuck is taken from a short bit of testimony uh, uh, in, in one of the Nuremberg trials. And he, um, so like some of these other things I'm talking about, he's dealing with primary documents um, uh, from the extermination process. And it's, there's only sometimes just a few pages, few words on each page. In fact, my afterword to the translation is much longer than the entire text of the, of the book. And I'm interested there that, uh, in, in the way in which he imagines the, um, what the relation of the original text is to the, to, the, um, to, the, to the poem that he creates. The absence of any information or commentary in the original publication, so you don't, when you read it originally, you don't really even know what it's from, needs to be acknowledged in an afterward that is many times longer than the 227 words of the original work. The translators kept translators' notes short. For my part, I want to offer this commentary in the first place to note that Backer's text, I am not now ready to say poem, is itself a commentary on the literature it cites in reference in, in the reference note as literature. So literature is the he uses the term literature in German to give this reference to what it's what it's from. And I'm really interested in this this term that he uses for not the poem itself, but the reference. If that makes both Bacher's text and mine midrashic, this could also be said of the source text from the Nuremberg Trials from June 21, 1941, narrating the event that appears to underlie this work. I am not going at this time to call it a poem. The long prose paragraph in the center of the work tells the story as recorded in the first person by the ship's captain. It is signed Flackensburg, a Nazi U-boat, a Nazi U-boat comes upon a shipwrecked Norwegian crew. The U-boat captain gives them provision, this little lifeboat, gives them some food, and points to the coasts of Iceland, knowing full well that they will perish. In the Nuremberg trial, Third Reich Vice Admiral Schulte Montig offers this commentary, quote, and this is not in Backer's book, I do not know what there is about this that is inhumane. I love this quote because in the book as a whole I talk a lot about this concept of the human and the humane, but I love this quote because I do not know what there is about that that is in inhumane. Pointing to Iceland. <laughs> so here we have a set of commentaries on an original event that is specifically occulted, shredded from its prose sources in the manner of N. Norbesi Phillips' Zom, in which Norbesi Phillips just incorporates and reassembles the re legal records of a 1791 extermination of 150 Africans on a slave ship so the owners could collect insurance money. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll lie the actual quote from the document that it's taken. The original of which seascape is an echo, the original document, or is it the original event, is not the transcript of the Nuremberg trial, nor the ship captain's diary that is included in the Nuremberg report, for these are themselves commentaries. Backer, who was born in 1925, was an Austrian poet associated with the Vienna group and also concrete poetry. Seascape situates itself on the ground of the, sh of the shipwreck. A quote from Mallarmé uh, from the coup de day, the ground of the shipwreck and is part of a series of quasi-documentary works that collage or cut up found texts, including in the US, Reznikoff, Ruckheiser, Olson, Burroughs, Geisen, and Susan Howe. It's interesting also in Backer's case that, um, that his own uh, parents were involved with the SS. So unlike all the other cases I'm giving, he has a direct connection with the extermination process through his parents. The most specific European predecessor for CSK is two books by the Swedish poet Ake Hotel. I just want to mention Aki Hodel is another person who takes these documents and just creates very uh, elided uh, references uh, to them. Um, either prisoner numbers or things that were confiscated. 
so just lists. Seastruck was published in 1985, the year before Bakker's stunning and exemplary achievement, not shrift. Dalkey Archive uh, published this book as transcript in 2010 with an English translation uh, by Greeny and Vincent, Patrick Greeny and Vincent Kling, and edited by Frederick Oschler. Transcript was published in Austria in 1986, is made up entirely of quotations or citations, which are often visually arranged in a manner that resembles the grid list of concrete poetry. These found linguistic shards confront without summarizing or representing the systematic extermination of the European Jews. In contrast to Reznikov's elegiac event moments in Holocaust, Bakker's source texts, which overlap with those used by Reznikov, are sampled, fragmented, and constellated. Narratives under erasure, but in eradicable. Transcript sources are documented in notes that form an integral part of the text. Hilberg's Destruction of the European Jews is prominent among the works, and that's also the key text, uh, one of the key resources for, uh, for um, Shoah, for Landsman's film, appropriate for the poem, which feels like a long cut-up of that work, or to put it in a different way, a diastic reading of Hilbert, to use Jackson McClough's term for reading through a text, dia, reading through text selection. But in fact, there are many in various sources. Unlike Hilberg and Reznikoff, Backer was, oh, excuse me, I, I actually uh, repressed the fact here. Unlike Hilberg and Reznikoff, Backer was himself in the Hitler Youth. And this biographical fact, not explicit in the work, affects the reading in a way that is, uh, in, in a way that is exemplary of how such external factors always frame meaning. Fascinated that I make that mistake, even though I know very well, but I'm displacing it, almost wanting to not put, not, 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 not misrecognize him as the poet. In the first edition, the cover for Seascape reads, um, uh, a Nachschrift by, Nachschrift would become the title of the next book, but here it is used as a description. Green, at, Green he translates Nachschrift as transcription, emphasizing that the words taken entirely from or after source text, and placing the work squarely in the company of such works as McClough's of the 50s to the 80s, entirely derived from prior or found text. But Nachschrift literally means after writing, or writing after. In prisms, Adorno writes famously, after Auschwitz, to write a poem is barbaric. Seastruck and Nachschrift absorb the problems of reification and representation after the Second War. As for literature, Bacher's use for Bacher's term for his source material, that is the before writing, the writing of witness, that which places itself before, in front of the event. This is a quote from the Nuremberg document. I turn down their request to be taken aboard, provisioned the boat with food and water, and gave them the course and distance to the Icelandic coast. <laughs> to write poetry after the Second War is to accept that barbarism is before us, staring us in the face. Does this overbearing commentary destroy the original? That is a hopeless hope. I do not know what there is about that that is inhumane. Ich bin ein Norwegian. Bacher's Nachschrift, his after writing, feels for the ground of a post enlightenment after modern poetry as a blind person feels for another's face. Here in Warsaw is an extraordinary new museum that has been created as if from ashes. This is a museum not of artifacts, but of the historical record. The Museum of the History of Polish Jews overwhelms, not with abstract splendor or Holocaust memorial kitsch, as in the statue in front of Berlin's Frederikstrasse station of children going, of, uh, which seems to depict children going off to camp, as if it's summer camp rather than a death camp. This is a museum of deep or thick description. In place of sentimental, monumental, or abstract gestures of loss, icons that mark an absence, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews provides a superfluity of what was present to substantiate and transubstantiate what has been lost. The museum is a living archive, not a funeral pyre, and it succeeds in making indelible the presence of the Jews in and as Poland, 
not an eradicated blip in Polish history, but an ineradicable thread in the fabric of Poland. Ineradicable even after being eradicated, as in Poe's telltale heart. Under the floorboards that seem to seal us off from the ground is a beating heart. Or here, let's just say, once the floorboards that cover the ground are removed, a vast underground cavern is, re is revealed, as deep as the world and as wide as possibility. This cavern is not filled with broken rocks or statuettes of forlorn children. As we look into it more closely, we can see that it is a book. A few years ago, I was in China to give a keynote speech for the second uh, uh, conference of Chinese and American Poetry and Poetics. And I will be going back to China next week for the third. On the drive from Zhangyang to the Wudang Mountains, there was a sign posted on the road. Curve continuous was the, was the English. <laughs> Curve continuous. Something in America we would have said in a far less poetic way. Caution, road curves. And I thought, yes, this is my aversive poetics. Curve continuously. When we got to the Wudang Mountains, the trip to the highest summit was not easy. We struggled with steep ascent. And I thought of Langston Hughes' life ain't been no crystal stair. My own personal journey Hughes' racial mountain, the mountain that separates one towering culture from another as the US and Europe, or perhaps also the Europe of today from the Europe of 1943. The view from the top of the Wudang Mountains as the Golden Palace, at the, the view from the top of the Wudang Mountains at the Golden Palace was no better than the views below. All were sublime. What distinguished the view from the top was the difficulty getting there. Life ain't been no crystal stair. The difficulty of the journey overwhelmed the destination, which became a pivot, a place to turn around and go back down the mountain or up another peak. Our journey was not over. It was always just beginning. When we get to one of the many peaks in the Wudan Mountain, a place that is a living home of Taoism, we saw all around us other peaks, other troughs, other paths. We are one among many, in unum pluribus, in one many, out of one many. Not a destination, but a way station, a place between the peaks. Life ain't been no crystal stair. Not a life of the poetics of the Americas, nor the relation of American poetry to European poetry, nor the journey back to Poland for Susan, nor for me. Curve continuously. Thank <laughs> you.